in my view, um, Inga's story is one of the, the, the really important stories in the history of the world of letters in Australia. Um, she doesn't know I'm going to say this and she may be embarrassed about what I'm going to say, but as she has written um, with extraordinary power and, and uh, beauty, uh, she was stricken with a very serious illness some time ago and was um, at that stage gave away a, a distinguished but conventional academic career as an historian of, of um, Spanish America and uh, indigenous people, uh, somehow got through this illness and then decided um, to, to write about themes other than those that were kind of dictated by her professional career and academic life. And what she's produced um, since, I haven't looked up the dates exactly, but the late 1990s, are a string of um, astonishingly powerful and interesting and often very beautiful books. Um, one concerning the Holocaust, reading the Holocaust, um, a, a really powerful memoir, Tiger's Eye, um, some very striking and I think very prescient um, Boyer lectures, true stories. Um, and perhaps the most a book that I want to talk a bit about, um, Dancing with, with Strangers, uh, and then most recently uh, a collection of essays, uh, Agamemnon's Kiss. Now, I, I think that to have produced, uh, she's been grappling with issues that I'm, I've been interested in much the same time, in one case earlier, uh, particularly the Holocaust and the dispossession and the question of indigenous, non-indigenous relations. But to have produced so much um, in pretty difficult circumstances of such power and importance, um, I, I won't get another opportunity, I don't think, to do this in public. So I just want to say uh, what an astonishing um, effort of, of concentration and of commitment to the life of ideas and letters Inga has made. So this, I did want to... But now we should get on with our conversation. Well, I've known this young fella for a very long time, except I've not known him. When I was a tutor at Melbourne, Along and had a room assigned to me. The room next door went to uh, a young fellow in political science, and the thing I noticed about him was how hard he worked. And I was a bit horrified when I was settling down quietly for a sherry evening. He would come in, sweeping in, courteous, grave, with an armful of books, and he'd vanish into his room, and he'd come out with a different armful of books and go off with them come back the next morning, and so on. I've been productive in a very idiosyncratic and, um, what, self-indulgent way. Um, no, it's true. I've only read what I've wanted to read. I've only written what I've wanted to write. And I've written it out of my present experience or interests and I can go into that a bit more later but this seems to me absolutely unlike Robert who has written about issues he believes matter. The amount he has done as a public intellectual is astounding. I think he's told you something of his editorship of Quadrant and then leaving that then he became chairman of the board at the ABR, uh, and then he became chairman of the board and a very active publishing editor at Black Ink, where they do all sorts of very good things. They've just secured the publication of what I think is a great book in Australian history. This is an advertisement, but it's not commercial. I'm not attached to the outfit. 
a book by a man called James Boyce, Boyce on Van Diemen's Land. And he means what the title says, this is about Van Diemen's Land before it become, became Tasmania. And I think it's a great piece of colonial historical writing, which is a very difficult kind of writing to do. And he did it because at a crucial moment in his career, Robert and his friend at Black Ink um, sent him a contract. So he was able to continue. It's that kind of intervention in the writing life of others to bring to fruition something that matters that I associate with Robert's engagement with literature. Equally, when there's an event in the public world, he will organize a collection of essays from useful people and preface it with a clear and sober account of what the issues are. I find this, uh, meanwhile, he's managed to help raise a family uh, and he's held down a full-time academic job at my old university, La Trobe, and one of my spies, who happens to be my beloved daughter-in-law, uh, took his subject, and yes, she's verified what I've been told by dozens of other students. He is a great, generous, and compassionate teacher. So, you know, it's a pretty extraordinary collection of attributes, given that, unlike my idiosyncratic self-indulgent, I will do what I want to do now, uh, view of writing. It isn't quite true, I'll clarify that a bit later. He has chosen the hard road of uh, publicly required writing to make that kind of intervention. Or at least that's my reading of it. Now, it might be that I'm wrong. So I'd like to ask him, Robert, why do you write? No, I, I mean, I, I actually don't think I was. I know I wasn't in political science at Melbourne University, and I never Did worked you? in the evening. I was in history. No, I, I said you in... swept out um, in the evenings. But, with books. but everything after that, I think, was accurate um, in that uh, as a rendition of why do I write? Um, I was, I, I actually was at the university at a very, what to me was a very interesting time at Melbourne University in the 1960s. And it was interesting partly because we were arguing about a war um, and I found the arguments um, complex. But also, as I see now, it was a time when the culture was shifting. It, it, was, a, it was a moment of real ferment. And I was got to by some authors um, probably most importantly, as people who've read me will know, George Orwell. And there, there, there was a sense that writing mattered to the public world. Um, and I kind of have always taken it for granted that um, one of the things I would do is engage. I have, you know, in a way, I think it's a very naive view because I think power often determines things, but I continue with the view that argument should determine things and that good arguments should um, displace bad arguments and so on. And, you know, I, um, I've always uh, felt very committed to this country. I'm a, a close friend of mine, really my closest friend is a philosopher, Raymond Gator, and he remembers a conversation we had when we were both in England. And he was thinking of staying there as he partly has, and I was absolutely determined to, to, to return home. And I said, I want to, I love the country, um, I also come from a family that was displaced from Central Europe. I feel that I have roots somewhere and they matter to me and it, it matters to me what trajectory, that, what happens in the country. Um, I was ne to be honest, I was never much interested in party politics. I used to assume governments on both sides of the fence were more or less okay um, until the Howard years. And, um, <laughs> Then something new has happened to me. I became embroiled much more directly in the, the, the game of party politics, and um, I don't regret that at all, but it, it was new to me. I, I used to think, essentially, governments in Australia were fundamentally benign, uh, and there were differences, but I, I was not outraged by the sacking in 1975. As some here will know, I used to be thought of uh, as an ultra-right-wing reactionary. Um, but 
under the Howard, during the Howard years I shifted and, and so my engagement became in a way more intense and more controversial and I now find myself, strangely enough, um, the sort of enemy of, of, the, of the right, of the cultural right, which wasn't my intention but it's what, what has happened. But it's always been the same thing, a commitment to the direction of this country and, and, and not feeling an alternative but to get involved in argument about it. And the belief that argument will be effective? No, no. The belief that argument ought to be effective. Yeah, that's and what that I thought. I, I actually <laughs> think that I've seen, I've put argument after argument yeah. with, to which there's been no good response, yeah. but those who have not responded haven't um, seem to be much um, badly affected by uh, their, you know, they go on saying what they want to say. So I, I do think in the end power determines a lot and argument is secondary usually. But I, I just, my life would have no meaning if, mm. if I abandoned the idea that it was power rather than argument that mattered. So I go on, I mm. hope not naively, putting argument. And, you know, I mean, again, some people might have heard me on Sunday. I was bowled over by the um, speech that Kevin Rudd made. Mm. And I had despaired about that sort of issue mattering. And I saw then that it did matter to go on arguing, even in, in, in mm. pretty bleak times. Right. You know, for me, that's so different from my feeling of engagement with this country, where I share your um, commitment to the place as a land. A lot of writers claim that they feel, feel alienated from the country. I've never felt that. Uh, in fact, I'm developing a rather alarming tendency to stroke gum trees as I age, <laughs> because they are so beautiful. Um, but for me, the why I write question would be answered something like this. Um, let's see if I can find, yeah. Jonathan Franzen, who's an interesting guy, I think, in How to Be Alone, which he recently published. He's talking about why he writes. And a friend says to him, looking me in the eye, he said, you are a socially isolated individual who desperately wants to communicate with a substantive imaginary world. Now actually, that's pretty much why I write, I think. I imagine an audience. I am socially isolated and always have been. As a child, I was the last in a sequence of children with big gaps of age. So, uh, you know, I was solitary. Um, I enjoyed it, I conserved it, um, and then when one thing I don't agree with, with Robert's account of my life, I was in fact passionately in, engaged with what he dared to call indigenous elements, was it? I happened to be the Aztecs and the Maya, for God's sake. That's, you know, pretty glossy stuff. Fascinating, utterly challenging, because they inhabited an imaginary world utterly unlike mine. So it's the ultimate in space and time travel to make a serious, sustained effort over years from the scraps of evidence you've got, you know, the traces of their thought that have been left to you, material traces, in writing, in post-conquest action, all those fragments to put together um, some sense of the world they inhabited. And that still seems to me the most compelling, absorbing and challenging thing I've ever been involved in doing. And I mourn for it because when I became ill, my brilliant tribe of doctors said, there's no way we're gonna let you go back to Mexico. That's it. So, uh, that was it. However, I then discovered another imagined world. Oh, something else happened, I guess. With the liver transplant, I became committed to the community of this country because I had been given an immense gift by one particular family, unknown to me, but also by the public of Australia in a crucial sense because your taxes finance these things. And after that, 
uh, my isolation was very much mitigated by my sense of obligation to the people who'd done that and who would do that. Because it doesn't happen in many other countries as it happens here. So then I discovered through writing Tiger's Eye or having it put together for me, my jottings when I was ill, by a brilliant publisher, that there really existed in this country something I hadn't known about and which vitiated my notion of social isolation, which was the Republic of Letters. I discovered it, I think in this tent, about um, in 2000, when I came to my very first Writers' Festival. And there they were, assembled, coming out in the rain or the heat or whatever it might be, reading because reading mattered to them passionately, listening because listening mattered to them, asking questions vividly present. And I had never seen that before. And there you all were. And there was the Republic of Letters. Whether you were only occasionally assembling in this kind of uh, moment, but always present, this subterranean secret society with whom it was possible to hold a conversation. And that seemed to me a deeply thrilling thing to discover. Um, and it's gone on from that with an awareness, in a way, my interest has been in fathoming what I am thinking about that's consonant with what you are thinking about. Um, because I think in a curious way, people share, in a particular country, share the same concerns, the same shifts of um, awareness. I think Robert's right. I think we're going through a major shift in awareness now on matters indigenous. Um, an actual move instead of the frozen bewilderment we've inhabited for too long. And that might be the next thing I try to write about. But there is this sense of an audience which is um, a participant in your own explorations, that you are consulting with them. And that's where I think we differ. It seems to me that you sometimes feel like a voice crying in the wilderness, but cry you will because you are determined to carry across a particular political analysis at a particular time. I happen somewhere way before politics, I suspect. I'm more concerned with emotional textures um, and almost pre-articulate worries, you know, in trying to get them precipitated into words so we can have a look at them. I'll just say something about that. Um, I reread quite a bit of um, your work before mm. the session. Um, and I noticed that I think you and I use the word we in, in yep. prose differently. Yep. Um, my use of it is always we being Australians or citizens, I think. I use it consciously, I like it, but uh, some people don't like the use of it at all, but I like it, but it's to do with citizenship. Your we is more, if, if I'm not wrong, this sort of audience. It, 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 mm. it actually assumes a moral community or a literary community or a community of feeling yeah. that uh, you, you talk as if we feel this and you're refining for that audience through your own uh, as it were, explorations of your own thought, what we as a sort of the literary or the, or the moral community feel. Um, and it, can I, just because I, th I think this ought not to be a mutual admiration society, I'd like to, 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 to raise um, some more difficult questions.